of the Canadian Association for Equality, CAFE, which uh, they've got stuff set up outside. They're a national nonprofit which is devoted to education and advocacy on gender issues. Right now, they mostly focus on women's issues. Out in the hall, we should have some more information about the UTMIA. So we have things like the mandate, major areas of concern, FAQs, the obligatory information sign-up sheet. Uh, any of the students here, we're always looking for new volunteers and new members. Uh, running these events is kind of like hunting cats, except a little bit worse. I think Cafe have, uh, they, they've actually got a whole table set up there along with the tip jar and so on and so on. Uh, it's pretty much the same stuff as we've got from UTMIA. Hopefully this will all go well, hopefully things won't be too disruptive. Uh, we'll see how that goes. We've got uh, a fairly launch campus police presence, so they shouldn't be able to do anything particularly nasty. It's very important uh, to us that every point of view has a chance to be heard. Uh, we've talked to the U of T Office of the Vice Provost Students, and we do need to point out there are a few U of T policies that are in effect during the presentation. Uh, first of all, there's of course the U of T Student Code of Conduct. Um, all the students here have probably never read it. <laughs> uh, there's the U of T Governing Council Statement on Freedom of Speech, which is why we didn't have this event in the first place. And the U of T Policy on the Disruption of Meetings. Anyone who was here for the last meeting got a really great demonstration of what that looks like uh, when everybody had to evacuate into the fire hole. Uh, finally, there's the U of T Statement on Prohibited Discrimination and Discriminatory Harassment. That's pretty self explanatory We're really proud of our approach uh, with the uh, UTMIA and CAFE. We don't want to shut down the people who want to talk about us. We're not even going to stop the protesters beyond stopping them from completely disrupting the event. Obviously, we encourage people uh, with their own uh, cameras, photography, videography. We don't have anything to hide yet. <coughs> We're always happy to have dialogue. There are a lot of people who have tried very hard to get these events out of U of T. Obviously, we don't support that uh, because we think that overall dialogue benefits everyone. In advance of this event, we actually sent out invitations to a number of different groups, uh, including the UTSU itself, a number of uh, specific feminist academics, and uh, REM. Nobody but REM actually responded. Everybody just ignored it. Uh, REM gave us a very polite response that said, no, we're not coming because we think you'll like it. Or at least that's when you read between the lines a little bit. Now, there was a media release on everybody's seats. I don't know how many people have had a chance to read it. We've had a fair bit of lag time. It talks about some of the stuff going on with these particular protesters, some of the stuff that happened at the last event, and overall the situation. There is a longer version of that that goes into a bit more detail on the website at www.ecolonycanada.com. Uh, it'd be great for everybody to check that out. There's all sorts of stuff there as well, and obviously we put all of the events up there in advance. <laughs> In light of some previous comments, I'd also like to quickly mention that UTMIA and CAFE put on these talks with a view to making sure that a wide variety of viewpoints are represented. This means we don't always agree with everything that speakers have to say, but feel that everybody should have a chance to see these various opinions presented and make up their mind themselves. In particular, it's important to be aware that the uh, beliefs of the speakers do not always represent the official policy of U uh, UT, uh, UTMIA or CAFE, or the uh, beliefs of the individual members. This is especially true with regards to speakers' views that lie outside the specific field that we brought them to speak about. Uh, we'd also like to mention that CAFE and UTMIA are not affiliated with any other organizations, uh, pretty much standalone. We bring in speakers because we think they're interesting and they've got something to say, but we don't maintain any specific affiliations. Without further ado, we have a couple of quick announcements, and then we'll get started. Can I get uh, Ian? You know? Uh, yeah, so I'd like to start out just by giving uh, a very big thank you to the UTMIA uh, to take a lot of courage uh, as a student to come forward and organize something like this um, when you know the kind of opposition you're facing. Um, I think it really speaks to the strength of your character and strength of your beliefs uh, that you're a bigger reason for this.
Uh, finally, uh, Edward's already touched on what we're about. Uh, we're an educational nonprofit. Uh, our goal is to raise awareness of underrepresented gender issues. Uh, we've been around for about a year, about two years, uh, active for about a year and a half. Uh, and really, uh, our organization can't exist uh, without your support. Uh, so please, uh, if you do like what you see, if you'd like to see more events like this, uh, please do go to our website uh, and join CAFE. Uh, it's $60 for a year-long membership, uh, $100 for a two-year membership, and we also have a low-income or student membership for $20. Uh, so please uh, do go in and do that. Uh, that, along with donations at these events, uh, are really what allow these things to happen. Uh, so without further ado, I'll hand it back to Edward, and uh, we'll get the talk started. Thank you. Okay, now everybody probably knows who our two speakers here are, but I'm going to introduce them again. On the right, on your left, is Paul Nathanson, and on your right is Catherine Young. They've both done a lot of work on the subject of misandry, and they've published several books on the subject. Uh, now, you guys are both from McGill University in Quebec. What are your fields of study, specifically? You kind of have to get used to talking over the sound. And the, if you can't hear me, let me know. You can just pick up the mic, too, if you want. That'd be easier. Just pick it right up, it'll come right out of that thing and you can hold on to it. Just pull it straight forward, there you go. Then you can talk right into it. You don't have to shout then. There you go. Okay, so help me out with this one. <clears throat> My field is the field of religious studies, which you may think that's about as far away from the Sandry as you could possibly get. But there's a link here because as I started to study other cultures, and my major field is in India, I had to learn techniques such as empathy. How do you get to understand another view? How do you cross cultures? How do you communicate? And once you learn that through experience of other cultures, it becomes very similar to think about communication between them and you. We have many similarities and also many differences. So my field, uh, my base field was in India, but then I did a lot of work in comparative religion. And from there, in the early 70s, as the issue of women became so important, I began to write on women in Hinduism, and then did a number of books on women in different religions, inviting a number of different women scholars and men scholars to contribute to those volumes. And from that comparative insight, I began to get a certain multi-dimensionality about gender. But that's the point where I met Paul, and we began to think of where are men in this discussion. Oh, you can. Can you hear me? Yeah, bring it closer here. Okay, well, I uh, traced my interest in this topic, this depressing topic, I must say. <laughs> Um, to my childhood, um, in the first place, um, I had a, a difficult relationship with my father, not because of the difference in the story of the Ajay father, but because we were really quite different. And I didn't really understand why until many years later, when it became clear to me that I was gay. And um, my father was actually very um, supportive uh, in terms of my being gay, um, and uh, before he died a few years ago, in his 90s, we had had many conversations, not only about that, but also about the other ways in which we had been different and, and in which communication had been very hard for us. Um, another factor uh, is that uh, when I was uh, a child in school, I had a lot of uh, bullies. And, um, and now today, of course, you hear stories every day about the parents of bullies going to sue the bully, bullies in, in court. Uh, in those days, he was living. Um, but it, it uh, you know, I'm listening to all this stuff going on in the background, and uh, my message to them is, you know what? I'm not in great form anymore. I'm not going to run from the crime. I'm here, and I'm going to say what I want. So this. <laughs> You know, once again, I had to ask myself, 
what it meant to be a man. I didn't know from my father exactly what it meant to be a man. He was, um, compared to my mother, I would say that he was somewhat unhappy because although he was uh, an engineer and he built houses and we weren't rich, but he was reasonably successful at that, but he was not happy because he would have preferred infinitely to be, uh, to be a researcher. And he became uh, a builder mainly because he had a uh, wife and a family to support. Um, and um, so, uh, you know, the bullies were telling me that I was no good as a boy. And by the way, I should add uh, that the bullies were both boys and girls. I, I was not aware of any difference in what they said or did. Um, so then, um, you know, this will tell you something about my age. Um, I was uh, about in my 20s um, when I went to Columbia uh, to study art history. Um, and that was in 68. And that was the height of the Vietnam War. And so suddenly I was confronted with the direct possibility of being drafted for combat. And um, I discussed that with a number of the other boys at, at uh, Columbia, and I noticed a very interesting reaction. I mean, they were clearly uncomfortable. They certainly had no intention of going to Vietnam. Most of them, or all of them, had student deferments. This was before they established a lottery to discover who was going to go. Um, but they were uncomfortable about talking about the specific thing that bothered me, because I was less interested at that point in the Hawks of the Doves, the Geneva Convention, the Paris Accords, and what have you. I was interested in what manhood had to do with being a soldier. And that was something that was kind of off balance. They weren't going to discuss that. That, that was a, they considered that a threatening topic. Um, and so I, I just went back home. I didn't get my degree. I, I came back to Canada. And um, 10 years later, on uh, the 10th anniversary of Vietnam, uh, suddenly it was all over the news again. And, um, and by that time, I had the emotional and intellectual resources to, uh, to, to try and figure out on my own what this was all about and what it meant to be a man. Um, and so that's approximately when I met Catherine and uh, we went to visit together. Now, how has your research on misandry related to some of the other research you've done? Interact, or in which secularity, including popular culture, interacts with religion. 